And then and then we would say, are you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. And the other one, are you okay? I'm fine. Okay, we're both fine. Okay, let's go shake hand and let, let's walk out of here. But if you, you, you hurt, then okay, let me go see the doctor or something. Or if you got sick, you go see an herbalist. You got a little supplement. You eat right. And over here, you have to worry about all this health care. We don't have no health insurance, and we don't have to worry about paying somebody else's for them to be wealthy. We take care of ourselves, and, and there was no, none of other thing that we had to worry about, all this mumbo-jumbo thing we have over here. Well, you know, and I, I don't want to get in the differences of country. Yeah. I, you know, people come from Vietnam to here, obviously, for a reason. This is not perfect. That's not perfect. You guys have a distinct advantage in as you really don't have 72% of the world's attorneys. <laughs> That's like, you know, hey, we want to be the world's dump. Uh, you know, people still come here because irrespective of all the issues, uh, it's probably one of the best places to be, just not as good as it used to be. Uh, it, I, I'm just trying to give you a concept of why a lot of what happens, if you can control your behavior, you can control the situation much better. If you allow them to control your behavior, they will control the situation. So whether it be the social security number and understanding those concepts or what we're going to go through today, it, it's all about control, doing the right thing. In order to do the right thing, you have to know what the right thing is. In order to know what the right thing is, you must know what the presumptions are there. You woke up this morning presuming the sun was going to come up. Some of us felt that that was going to be way too early, but we got up anyways. The If you are one of those people that have all those issues with depression or bipolar, perhaps you're thinking that maybe one day the sun isn't going to come up. Your presumptions are going to be wrong. You're going to behave differently. So a lot of that is what we're going to be doing here today is, is understanding the ways that you're going to go about rebutting presumptions, primarily through documentation, through expert witness, and and how to lead the court through your behavior. There's rules for this guy. This is the defense. In this case, this is going to be the bank, the mortgage company. There's rules for this group. This is the plaintiff. They are, are very similar sets of rules, but things are done in order. Normally, the plaintiff will do something. The defendant will respond. Then they can reply. This is the gallery. There's one rule for them. Shut the hell up. <laughs> There's a judge. The rule here is you came directly from the womb of Satan. Act like it. <laughs> There's rules for this person. This person takes an oath. Now, okay, I've got to give you a caveat on that. There's no longer in law any requirement for an oath. There's a requirement for an oath or an affirmation. I do affirmations because I don't swear to anything. Usually, if I'm swearing, I'm three Jack Daniels into it, and it's not pretty words. That is how I consider swearing. Okay? You, in, in my belief system, we don't swear an oath. We do an affirmation. SCOTUS has agreed with that because of the freedom of religion. So we do an affirmation. It's really the same thing under law. They're both under perjury. You can go to jail if you do an oath or an affirmation and you're caught lying. Court is one continuous lie after another, after another. That's all it is. Don't do that here. Okay, if you're going to take a witness stand, do not lie. Hey, I really, I'm telling you, don't do it. It'll bite you. Don't lie in your document. We don't need to lie. That's the bank's job. That's the judge's job. That's the attorney's job. We don't need to lie. We're right. We're telling the truth. <sighs> the, the other group in here is a jury. Most of you will never see a jury. 
if, if you don't do a good enough job to win it before you get to that point, it's probably over with. I doubt any of you will see a jury trial in this matter. If we don't get this down good enough and you can't operate in court good enough to get rid of this before it goes to trial, you, you've probably already lost. But we're going to do this because this is going to be a lot like trial. Now, I'm going to go over one other concept because we talked about it earlier this morning and uh, everybody, apparently nobody really knows it. Uh, and we'll, we'll take a break. Everybody's heard of the Fifth Amendment. How many people have actually read the Constitution? I would like to, and I mean, be honest, read the whole Constitution. How many people understand what it is? Yeah, see, no, you don't. No, you don't. No, you don't. See, you think you do, and you're wrong. And, and what is it Amos said? It ain't what I don't know that'll hurt me. It's what I think I know, and I'm wrong, that gets me killed. You don't know what the Constitution is. I, I, I've had arguments with constitutional attorneys and had to explain to them what the Constitution is. Uh, the Constitution was not the founding document of the United States. The Treaty of Paris of 1783 was. Is it 1781? I may have that. Well, I don't know that I, I, I bring it around, Monroe, because I don't want it damaged. Uh, in 1776, a bunch of guys got together, drank a little too much, got pissed off, and decided they were going to get rid of England. And they wrote the Declaration of Independence. And that was like the first part of a notorial certificate of dishonor. Uh, then everything went to hell. And can we kill the cell phones, please? Uh, no. Oh, I know where that is. I didn't want that thing damaged, so I didn't bring it. Be very careful with this. I will pass this around. This is a, a certified copy of the original 13th Amendment, the one that disappeared, the one that made it uh, illegal to be an attorney in the United States. It, that just up and disappeared one day. So in 1783, they created the Treaty of Paris, or they wrote the Treaty of Paris. That created a country called the United States. It's like a second part of a notorial... Certificate of Dishonor, an administrative process, a true administrative process in law. Then they sat down after they created this country. They had to create some kind of charter, a rule of operating this country that stems from the treaty that created the country that came from the lawful notice, the declaration to inform the other party they were separating ties. Sound like an administrative process to those of you that know what they are? That's what it was. Three parts, we're done. In the Constitution, which is the charter that tells us how to run things, you got to go to like the last page. The, the first page is just all the certificate stuff. And it'll tell you that if you take an honor, uh, like a knighthood, uh, you have to give up your citizenship. Does anybody know what an esquire is? Okay, an esquire, you'll see it at the end of most attorneys' names. You have in, in English law, uh, as a slave to the queen, you can be a gentleman, then an esquire, and then a knight. So when you become an attorney in the U.S., you have to give up all your loyalty to the U.S. and avow your rights to the queen. That's why some of us were very upset when, like, Colin Powell accepted a knighthood. Because that means we have nothing to do with the U.S. And that's kind of not a good thing for a, a military leader to do. But in the Constitution, you have what's called the Fifth Amendment. That's been adjudicated numerous times, all kinds of jurisprudence. The one that we're primarily familiar with is Miranda v. Arizona. That actually happened in, he, in this state. And it was due to an arrest from somebody that was too stupid to know, but more, more of a language problem than anything. 
it, it was, it, so they wrote down what an officer, an arresting party must tell somebody that's arrested. <laughs> Most of us have heard it enough that we can quote it. You have the right to remain silent irrespective of whether or not you have the ability. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in the court of law. Now, in law, what is excluded, or what is included, therefore, determines what is excluded. If it's not included, it is, therefore, excluded. So what is not included is that anything that you say can be used for you. Understand the reason we don't say anything when arrested ever at any time is not because we're scared that we might say something that'll be used against us. Anything you say that might be for you cannot be used. It can be altered so it can be used against you. But nothing you ever say at any time when you are arrested can ever be used in your behalf. It can't be. It's illegal. It will not happen. What they can do and what the law accepts is then to add a word here or there, take out a word here or there, have it rewritten, and then be used against you. Because when you agreed to open your mouth, you agreed to allow them to have the authority to change your words. Did you know that? If you say, I did not do it, the officer can remove the word not. That's the law. Sorry. <laughs> There's nothing you can do about it. That is the law. So uh, be very careful with that. I, I, you can all order that from uh, uh, the State Archives of Colorado. We don't do that in Arizona. We have a copy here. They won't make you a copy. Uh, and that, that is my last copy. Uh, and it's really cool because if you show it to an attorney, they did. It pisses them the hell off. Nobody's been ab ever able to discover what happened to the 13th Amendment. We, we don't know what happened to it. It, in 1865, just up and disappeared. And then we got this other 13th Amendment. So we'll take a break now. We will be back here in 15 minutes. We've got a, we do have one issue. I guess, how many people are actually staying at this hotel? Okay, are they telling you you got to be out of your rooms at 1 or something? Okay, so we'll take a break, and then at, what do you think, at 12.15, will that give you enough time to clear out your rooms, come down here, stack your stuff, and start back up? Is that good? Okay. Uh, you got another announcement? He will wait. Uh, oh, they and Cindy's got to make providing a place to store your stuff. Cindy's got a couple of announcements to make. I, I just, for, for my own curiosity... How many people would rate this as one of the best, if not the best, seminar they've ever been to? Oh, shit. I'll be drinking tonight, then. <laughs> Man's got to have a goal. Where's that thing? I guess, can you hear me? Am I on? Oh. I'm on. Can you hear me now? No? This one? This one is Hello? not on. I'm on. <laughs> okay, can you hear me? Okay, um, a few of you wanted to know the name and number of a, a process server who would help you in any state that you're in get documents to whatever state's process servers you need to send your documents to any defendants. So I have, um, I have two guys that are willing to do that. One's here in Phoenix and one's in California. And then I also have a process server I personally use for MERS, if you have anything that you're sending to MERS. Okay, so the first guy, he's here in Phoenix, and he will, you can mail him documents, and he will get them to wherever you need them to go. Um, his name is Mike. Last name is Napier, N-A-P-I-E-R. And his phone number is 602-488-5555. Five five. I'll say it again. It's six zero two four eight eight five 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 five. Okay, the next guy is in um 
Um, no, you'll just have to call him for that. Um, because what he'll do is you'll probably have to overnight him documents, or or not overnight, just mail them to him, and then um, he'll look up the pr other process servers across the country to get your documents sent to wherever. So if you just want a one-stop shop where you don't have to send multiple process servers documents, this guy would help you with that. Um,